Uh, welcome, Domenicella D'Agostino. Welcome to the Keto podcast. Uh, we're here at the Keto live event at Bergen in Switzerland. Um, uh, it's a five-day conference, just jam-packed with uh, uh, lots of great speakers talking about topics on the ketogenic mm -hmm. metabolic therapies. Um, and you're both speakers here too. And I'd like to thank you for taking the time for this interview. And I'd also like to thank the, the organizers, uh, Josephine and Stefan, for giving me the opportunity to, uh, to talk to you here today. Um, like I said, it, it's my privilege to, to, to talk to you both. And I feel like I already know you really well because I've heard many podcasts and interviews and heard a lot about you uh, as well. Uh, but for the Dutch and the Bel Belgian audience who don't know you yet, could you shortly uh, introduce yourselves? Should I like to start with you? Um, could you introduce yourself and uh, tell us a bit more about what you do? Yeah, sure. Uh, we are very happy to be here too uh, mm. at the Kido mm. Live event. So, uh, my name is Cilari D'Agostino and I'm originally from Hungary. I moved to the United States 13 years ago and I have a PhD in neuroscience uh, and I'm an assistant professor currently at the University of South Florida. And we do research on ketogenic therapies, metabolic therapies, exogenous ketones. Uh, we are working with astronauts, with NASA, with the Navy, uh, extreme environment missions. So we have a lot of lot of projects going on. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I saw uh, I heard that you always went uh, underseas in, in one of the subs. Yes, yes, both of us wow. uh, participated in, in those uh, missions. It uh, was a NASA extreme environment mission operation uh, 22 and 23 that we participated in and uh, we basically lived underwater uh, for 10 and 9 days wow. continuously and we did uh, simulated spacewalks, basically simulated extravehicular mm -hmm. activities going in and out of the habitat and then after uh, that we returned to the surface and we obviously we did we did a lot of lot of research yeah <laughs> wow during that must period. be very exciting to do that yes yes it was it was super exciting and uh, for me it was especially very exciting to work with some very professional people like for for example Samantha Cristoforetti and Jessica Watkins mm -hmm. uh, were part of my mission and they just came back from the international space station so they were basically cool. training to go to to space so they, they we actually use that habitat and that mission to simulate space missions wow and that the, there's a big role for for ketones there i learned so that's uh, that's really interesting yes so yeah. so ketones would have a big potential uh, during for for space travel uh, for for different reasons so that's another interesting area of research. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, amazing. Thank you. Uh, and Dom, um, mm -hmm. I feel like I really know you really well somehow, but <laughs> uh, could you tell us a bit more about uh, who you are and what you do? Sure. Uh, well, thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to go on your podcast. Uh, my background is actually originally in nutrition. That was my passion uh, as an undergraduate at Rutgers University in the United States, New Jersey. Uh, then I transitioned to study neuroscience and physiology. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the physiology of the neural control of autonomic regulation. So how our body responds to hypoxia and uh, oxidative stress. And I studied that uh, for my PhD. And then went on to a fellowship funded by the Navy to study extreme environments, including hyperoxia in the underwater environment. And that led me down a path to... Uh, develop and test different mitigation strategies that could enhance our safety, performance, and resilience in these environments. And uh, through looking at a variety of different methodologies to enhance our performance and resilience, I stumbled upon the ketogenic diet, which I did not spend much time on studying nutrition as an undergrad. And uh, this has been very efficacious in our hands for preventing oxygen toxicity seizures. And that led, uh, that research then gave us the fundamental understanding about how ketones can protect brain cells, can, uh, being in a state of ketosis can slow the growth and proliferation of cancer cells. Um, and, you know, we do, I do this research, I should take a step back at the medical college at the University of South Florida. So mm -hmm. I spend quite a bit of time teaching. Uh, at the undergraduate level, master's level, PhD level, and also medical students. <laughs> so I teach all them, 
And uh, when I can, I give the opportunity for these students to do research under me and to mentor them on various projects related to ketogenic diets, exogenous ketones. Uh, that could be projects in cancer, projects in diabetes, metabolic optimization. Uh, as Chilla mentioned, we, uh, the NASA's Extreme Environment Mission Operation mm -hmm. research, our students played a, a big role in helping to conduct uh, research. Chilla was instrumental in getting five IRB <laughs> protocols of research on that mission, so we did uh, an enormous amount of missions spearheaded by Chilla on that. Uh, I was the original uh, participant in NEMO 22, Shell Lindgren, uh, who just came back from the space uh, station a little while ago, was one yeah. of my commanders for that mission. Uh, but it gave us the opportunity to move the science of what we do in the lab uh, into uh, operational environment. And me, myself, I stayed in ketosis throughout that operational mission and did a variety of scientific experiments on myself and the crew. Yeah. And did you stay in ketosis through diet or through exogenous ketones? Uh, it was a combination of both, but I would say mostly driven by the diet. I think I used ketones sparingly, but I did use them throughout especially different times when we have to do an oxygen pre-breathe prior to decompressing to mm -hmm. come back up to the surface. Um, but yeah, my foods were, yeah, chicken, coconut oil, <laughs> you know, it's yeah. just uh, nuts and things like that. And I stayed in a very uh, austere diet, I guess you would say. Uh, I did lose during that 10 days about seven pounds, uh, even despite eating my normal caloric intake of close to 38 to 4,000 calories per day. I, I lost quite a bit of weight. Okay. And I think that had to do with doing extravehicular activities in the water. Mm. Uh, the cold, colder water, it becomes cold after a period of time, increases your metabolism. So I noticed after doing these things, I would be shaking for uh, the cold exposure. It yeah. was very physically demanding. Yeah. It was physically whole, demanding, whole, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm mission was designed to be physically and yeah. mentally challenging Part but interestingly <laughs> on his mission which was all males everybody lost a lot of weight yeah. Yeah. while right. on the mission that i was females we lost a little bit of weight but not, not too much, much. Yeah. so that not was so an good. interesting yeah. contrast that that all males lost a lot of weight while we yeah. Yeah, the that's interesting. It felt like we were eating all the time too so <laughs> maybe something yeah. about the environment uh yeah it was just uh we didn't track I, I mean i tracked but the crew was basically eating food that resembled space food like yeah. what, you know, dehydrated food you mix it with boiling water uh, it wasn't the most appetizing, but we were eating a lot of calories and we all lost weight. So yeah, it was, it was mostly like a prepackaged yeah. camping food, basically, yeah. that yeah. you just add hot water because you didn't have access no. to cook anything. No. So yeah. just freeze-dried food that you just add hot water yeah. and uh, Mimic basically what that's, all, space. that's yeah. All, yeah. all we had access yeah. to. But <laughs> so I can imagine uh, for us, uh, astronauts as well, if, if they go to, sp uh, to space and they want to follow ketogenic nutrition, um, that's not possible for them to cook up something up there. Um, so is that why yeah. they're interested in exogenous ketones? They're, okay, so this kind of goes back to 2014, where NASA uh, HRP, the Human Research Program, mm -hmm. did a what was called a blue sky mission, uh, a blue sky meeting at the Cosmos Club in Washington D.C. And the meeting was called Ketones and the Astronaut. Yeah. <laughs> and I was involved in that meeting a number, with a number of NASA representatives, including. Uh, this was very early sort of in my career and understanding this and the the basic premise of the meeting was that being in a state following a, a ketogenic diet was logistically feasible in space because of the energy density that was one thing that the engineers liked you mm -hmm. could get more calories per gram but the ketones also offer remarkable neuroprotection uh, and even protecting your genome in those environments. So there was six different research scientists, and I was one that presented different data on ketones. And that started a series of different workshops yeah. on this idea of um, ketosis for extreme environments. And another one was funded by a collaboration between the Navy and NASA because there's a lot of overlap between living in these habitats. So a submarine habitat or a confined environment an extreme environment in NASA. So they collaborated on different meetings. So there has been a number of different meetings which led to technical reports that went to the federal government to suggest, <laughs> to suggest that a ketogenic diet and ketones could be beneficial for long duration spaceflight. 
and this was done through, uh, spearheaded in part by the Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, or right. IHMC, and Ken Ford is the director of that. And he was a former director of NASA and also on the Defense Science Board for the president. So he has sort of uh, initiated this, uh, this idea uh, of using ketones in space, yeah. which is uh, not fully embraced, but is part of, there's an understanding that there could be an option for astronauts to eat low carb and to eat ketogenic if they prefer that, to have food options that would be available for yeah. that path. Yeah. Wow, mm -hmm. that'd be amazing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think, uh, I suppose you both know lots and lots and lots about uh, uh, ketosis, ketogenesis, uh, exogenous ketones. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have a couple of questions for the, for the public who are um, either professionals or just um, interested. Um, and they're about uh, uh, exogenous ketones and also measuring ketones. Um, and the thing that strikes me the most is that many people think that it's not natural to take exogenous ketones. Uh, it might even be... Um, totally nonsense to, to do that, um, uh, uh, it's fake ketosis. Um, but why would it be interesting to take ketones, exogenous ketones for, for any kind of condition? Perhaps you could uh, specify on that. Yeah. Well, uh, there are obviously many, many benefits to elevate uh, ketone levels in the body, starting from neuroprotection and, and a lot of, lot of different benefits. Uh, and what we experience from people from getting feedback is that many people have difficulty keeping the diet long term mm. so maybe people try it maybe they can keep up with the diet for for short term but long term they have difficulty to keep up the other option people can do is fasting but obviously not everybody can do fasting for example patients with cancer and anorexia uh, obviously, there is a limitation how long people can fast, and then once you don't don't fast, your ketone level is not going to be elevated. Uh, the other issue that sometimes we, we come across that people think that they are following the ketogenic diet, but they are not. So yeah. it's it's very hard for many people to understand how much and what they can actually eat to to be really in in ketosis from the ketogenic diet. It doesn't help that many brands, many companies come out that you can buy products with keto written on it and it's actually not keto, no. it's still elevating yeah. your, your glucose level. So people get disappointed that the diet doesn't work for them or they cannot do it long term, but still they want to enjoy the benefit of the ketone molecule that can do so many good things in your body, yeah. then it's an option to take the ketones from an exogenous supplement source. Yeah. Uh, so it also helps people to transition to the ketogenic diet. So when somebody decides to switch from a uh, standard diet to a ketogenic diet, there is a, a transition period uh, for a few weeks when your body doesn't get glucose, but it doesn't mm. produce ketones yet. So then mm. in this transition period, it, it's very helpful to, to get extra ketone from an outside source. So, so there, are, there are many, many mm. different applications. Yeah. yeah. I, I think it's important too, when we talk about the subject, that the history of exogenous ketones, which is very interesting, uh, it was mostly spearheaded by Dr. Richard Veach. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a student of Hans Krebs, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he was probably the leading expert that I can think of uh, that really spearheaded many different research tracks on metabolism. And one of them being his most passionate research track, I think, was ketosis or ketones and the favorable metabolic benefits you get from ke uh, ketones. And he was funded by DARPA, and this goes back to the 1990s, uh, through a program on warfighter dominance and warfighter mm -hmm. performance. <laughs> yeah. So the original application for exogenous ketones was a ketone ester for warfighter exercise performance and yeah. physical and cognitive performance. Uh, it was you know, early in my career that I discovered some of the funding and some of the research grants and patents associated with exogenous ketones. And I was studying oxygen toxicity seizures and also very interested in epilepsy where the ketogenic diet uh, outperformed all anti-seizure drugs. 
So the diet was a prescription strength diet, if you could label that. Uh, but there were many people unwilling or unable to follow the ketogenic diet to get the anti-seizure mm -hmm. benefits. So my original motivation uh, for doing the research that I was doing was to develop an exogenous ketone strategy to prevent seizures. And in the process of studying ketones, as Dr. R Richard Veach observed, we observed many uh, metabolic benefits. So a decrease in oxidative stress, a decrease in you know suppression of cancer growth, uh, improved neurotransmission, it changes the neuropharmacology of the brain. And we, we would incubate cells in different conditions that could be high oxygen, glutamate, or different toxins like azi that inhibits the mitochondria. And then that the ketones uh, would help preserve uh, neuronal function mm -hmm. and the, the life of the neurons. So when it comes to thinking about exogenous ketones as an artificial ketosis, when we consume ketones, it's your body perceives it as a source of energy, just like it would MCT oil or any yeah. kind of fat. So we simply break it down. Our body produces an endogenous metabolite that we could take an exogenous source that breaks down to that natural exogenous metabolite, much like taking branched chain amino acids or much like taking creatine monohydrate, mm -hmm which is the most studied nutritional supplement in the world. There's more studies behind creatine than any. It's like mixing up creatine and taking it. And creatine offers an advantage on muscle strength and function. Uh, and I do think that exogenous ketones, much like exogenous creatine, is sort of like uh, most of the science will emerge to support it in the same way. That this is a metabolic fuel not only a metabolic fuel, that there's a receptor for ketones, <laughs> multiple yeah, receptors. Yeah. Uh, there are multiple signaling pathways. Uh, ketones have epigenetic effects. They influence gene transcription in a very favorable way. So, uh, and they're also self-limiting in regards to toxicity. So for example, with ketone salts, you can't overconsume ketones unless it's a ketone ester, but with the ketone salts that we're mostly interested you can't overconsume it and go into a state of ketoacidosis because no. it'll be rate limiting the amount you can absorb. Yes. So much like MCT oil and ketosis. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that was one of my questions, but I'm I'm going to ask it now. Uh -huh. um, when you take endogenous ketones, does it uh, block your own endogenous ketone production? Mm -hmm. Does it happen at all? No. Well, only in the case of consuming a large dose of a ketone ester. So when we consume exogenous ketones, it actually upregulates the ketolytic enzymes and the ketone transporters. The presence of ketones in the blood and in the tissues will actually increase and upregulate the metabolism of ketones. So we know that, and there's literature on that. There's also literature showing that if you take a large dose of a ketone monoester uh, or even a ketone diester, your ketosis levels go up very high and a uh, counter-regulatory way in which we uh, modulate our endogenous ketosis is ketoneuria. We excrete ketones, but also a ketone-induced increase in insulin. So as our ketones get elevated, the pancreas will release a little bit of insulin, and that feeds back to the liver, and beta oxidation of fatty acids in the liver are part of ketogenesis. Mm -hmm. So that feedback mechanisms of ketone-induced pancreatic endocrine release of insulin feeds back to the liver and then reduces ketogenesis. So yeah. I have experienced and many other people have experienced that if you take a ketone salt, you could elevate ketones below two millimolar range, which I think is safe and healthy. But once you get spike it quickly above two millimolar, it releases insulin. And then that will, uh, with, that will with a ketone yeah. ester yeah. and that won't so it's important to understand that that rise in insulin will temporarily delay ketosis for a few hours. Uh, the implications are that if you take a, a large dose of ketone esters, your ketones go up very high, your glucose will go down a little bit, and then it will release insulin. And what will happen is that the ketones come back down, and then the insulin facilitates glucose disposal. So you will be hypoketotic and hypoglycemic yeah. a few hours later, and that could trigger a headache. Mm. So, or that could trigger negative symptoms. Whereas a gentle rise in ketones from MCT oil, yes. or more favorably ketone salts, maybe mixed with MCT oil, you get a nice rise in, in ketosis, like a natural ketosis, 
that doesn't stimulate insulin and then does not change your body's ability for making ketones. Okay. And then, so I have actually consumed larger doses of ketone ester, which can shut off your exogenous, or your endogenous ketones, and then stop taking it. And then my ketones level will be low for a couple hours, but by the end of the day, if you're fasting, they'll come back up again. Yeah. So ketone salts do not shut down uh, ketosis acutely. Ketone esters do, but when you stop it all together, uh, you know, within the days after that, your body is actually probably ramped up better to yeah. actually make ketones. We, we also see in, in more and more projects that there is a range that is optimal. Like there is yeah. a misconception that everybody thought that elevating your ketone level as high as possible, that's the best mm -hmm. thing you can do. Mm -hmm. Much and like see, glucose, like yeah. higher is not better. Yeah. Actually. So we see in, in multiple projects that there is a range, so you don't want to elevate it too high either. So what we see is mm -hmm. maybe one to two millimolar is the is the is the yeah. good healthy range yeah. for for yeah. most people. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. if there is some kind of disease condition that like epilepsy that would require a little yeah. bit higher, yeah. but yeah. but for most people mm -hmm. you don't want to elevate it higher than two millimolar mm -hmm. because yeah. then yeah. the body will start having like compensatory mechanism. Yeah. So, and that's kind of yeah. what happens naturally with like a keto carnivore diet or just like, you know, a, a, a med modified ketogenic diet that's higher in protein. I do think that the clinical ketogenic diet that's four to one or three to one is very extreme. Yeah. And that was in recognizing this early on and realizing that we need to have some alternative strategy for developing therapeutic ketosis. So that was the motivation. But as time went on, we realized that just simply carbohydrate restriction with, you know, a more of a, a instead of a protein restriction, more moderate protein diet, that's 25, 30% protein even, that high, is as long as carbohydrates are restricted, that that's sufficient enough to produce a mild state of ketosis. So that could even yeah. achieve one to two millimolar. But many people like to include uh, ample amounts of vegetables and fruits and maybe even some starches into their diet. And that would surely bring them out of ketosis. They may be an optimal diet per se, but they would not be get, getting the metabolic, anti-inflammatory and epigenetic benefits of mild ketosis. So you could simply add in some exogenous ketones. You could add in MCT oil if you can tolerate it. Many people can't, but, but achieving following a healthy diet that's non-ketogenic, but adding ketones in can have favorable changes in our physiology, in our brain, in cancer suppression. So these are things that we're really interested in, not only treating disease, but also preventing disease. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's really interesting. Um, and I was uh, thinking, you said um, uh, tolerable, uh, as long as someone yeah. can tolerate it. Yeah. Uh, I've, uh, I've heard from several people, they have some problems taking uh, uh, either uh, the esters or the, the salts. Yeah. Uh, like GI uh, problems or uh, mm -hmm. headaches. Um, yeah. it, would yes. that be a reason to MCT to too. MC yeah. 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 The MCT is used clinically problem. and that's a problem with that. But then yes, so she could talk so, about so the, that. So yeah. the problem with the MCT is that, that most people can only tolerate a, a very low dose. And if you want to induce uh, uh, more elevated keto levels, then it's hard with, with MCT because most people just can't tolerate it. Yeah. Uh, there are GI issues. With the ketone ester, the problem is that the, the taste is very bad. It's uh, many people say it's like jet fuel, jet fuel or kerosene, yes. and it's like impossible to flavor it. So every single product is just tastes terrible. And again, many people just can can tolerate it. Yeah. With ketone salt. Uh, there are different variations, so it depends on the formulation, how it's formulated. Some of those products can cause GI issues, but it is possible to formulate it in a way that it doesn't cause GI issues. So, so that's our yeah. preference that yeah. uh, a well-formulated ketone salt will not cause this kind of side effects. Yes, so good. And you have your own brand? Developing your own products. Yes, yeah. yes. So over the years, I obviously I became inspired, seeing all the results, all the science, all the benefits that these molecules can do. And like I said, it was just frustrating to see that people can't benefit from it because there's there's nothing uh, that they could consume to to uh, help them. Mm -hmm. So 
It took almost three years uh, with, the uh, with the help of the University of South Florida. I became involved in a business program that the government established to train academic scientists to uh, uh, establish companies and create products that are based on their inventions. Uh, so uh, I created the company Audacious Nutrition and uh, I formulated a couple products uh, that are now available almost two years now. So yeah. I'm getting a lot of, lot of good feedback from people who are getting a lot of benefits uh, that before that they, they had no options or they were disappointed yeah. uh, by other products that they, they tried. Yeah. So it's very encouraging and it's very positive. Yeah, and it should be great if it came to mm -hmm. Europe as well because there are still problems getting it on the market here. So yeah. we're waiting and hoping for that. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, the, the biggest question I get asked all the time is by athletes or cyclists uh, who are interested in improving their performance. Um, should they or should they not use exogenous ketones um, uh, and in what way? Um, should they take it on the day of the, of the race or should they take it as in, in the training program? Can you say anything about I, that? I work with, with a couple of athletes uh, mm -hmm. who are taking uh, it before. Uh, their performance. So, uh, for example, my very first customers were um, uh, a hockey team, a famous hockey team mm -hmm. in, in the US. Who th they took uh, the supplement before and during their uh, the play uh, when they played, and they went on getting their second Stanley Cup. And mm -hmm. so okay. they were my very first customers. Since then, I, I uh, started sponsoring a, a triathlon athlete, and he is mm -hmm. now the in the first ten best uh, Ultraman World Championship triathlon athlete. Uh, so he's taking it during the race uh, okay. uh, while he's he's doing the, the running and cycling. Um, it is also very beneficial, for example, for sports who are exposed to concussion. Yeah. So uh, people who are doing, uh, for example, MMA fighters are taking it to, to protect the brain from uh, micro injuries. Yeah, or football players. Or yeah. football players mm -hmm. yeah, or, or mm -hmm. uh, ice hockey, for yeah. example. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so for sports uh, like this. But usually people uh, who have like a race, a shorter uh, duration race, they would want to take the supplement before, like 30, 40 minutes before, yeah. before the okay. race. Mm -hmm. um, but if there is a longer duration, like for example, a marathon run, you would want to mm -hmm. take it before and consume it throughout yeah. the, the race. And the electrolytes yeah. too. Yeah. So yes, her formulation extra, yeah. has an electrolyte um, ratio similar to different electrolyte products like element is another product that's quite popular on the market but yeah. it's kind of the same ratio but the the elements the the electrolytes are bound to ketones yeah. so you're supplying ketones and you're supplying the electrolytes that you'd be uh really in need of if you're an athlete so yeah. it becomes uh and some of the athletes maybe not all of them uh, i know the triathlete uh, he's also following a low-carb diet like ketogenic like carnivore type diet so but I think you could use the product with or without depending on your athletic sport you might want to maintain metabolic flexibility to actually you know be eat carbohydrates and fat and protein and and you know and to be flexible across different macronutrient ranges yeah. depending upon your sport but ketones are just an, an alternative source of fuel that would aid in your body's you know generating ATP you know, during the sport. And yeah. um, we published a paper recently, a series of papers uh, looking at with Tim Noakes was mm -hmm. one of the authors, uh, Dr. Andrew Kutnick, one of my students, and a number, Dr. Philip Prinz. Uh, this was athletes that were on a low carb diet or high carb diet, and they followed it for a period of time, 30 days, and then they did a crossover. Mm -hmm. It was a crossover design, and the low carb then went to high carb. What we saw, they were wearing continuous glucose monitoring, is that the high carb athletes, and they're all the athletes, their glucose levels were in the range of pre-diabetic. So even though they're elite athletes, even though they had superior metabolic physiology, eating a high carb diet, independent, it was isocaloric. So both we calorie matched the high carb diet and low carb diet. Mm -hmm. the, they were, their glucose levels were clearly 10, 10 to 15 points higher. 
you know, on the high carb diet, and that's looking at it circadian across 24 hours. Yeah. So that has major implications for people who are athletic and think they could, you know, follow, eat lots of carbohydrates. Uh, they are, their physiology is set up in a way that their glucose levels are persistently higher across the 24 hour period. Yeah. And that is not favorable for longevity. No. So, and Tim Noakes, you know, mentioned this, and I was brought into his sort of science a little later on uh, because uh, endurance sports was not my focus. So we focused mostly on neuroscience and cancer, and then later on, uh, I mean, she'll observe observations, and we did in our animal models, they would run farther and longer yeah. <laughs> in the state of ketosis. And then we gradually got a little bit more interested in uh, athletic sports and also the anti catabolic effects of ketones and yeah. sparing muscle, especially during athletics yeah. or inflammation states like cancer cachexia or age related sarcopenia. Yeah, okay. Yeah. It's a bit noisy out yes. there. <laughs> um, the thing I was wondering about is um, uh, I, I was trying to find information um, about uh, use of ketones for uh, athletes, especially cyclists, for example, yeah. because that's, that's quite hot in, in Europe for the, yeah. for the Tour de France, oh, yeah. for, for example. And I read something about uh, oxidative priority um, and yep. that exogenous ketones come before glucose. Mm -hmm. um, and I read somebody saying, oh, no, I would never, ever touch uh, ketones on the day of the race because they block my own uh, utilization of the glucose. Mm -hmm. There's absolutely no evidence of that. Okay. <laughs> but there is evidence that if you're on a ketogenic diet, a very strict ketogenic diet, that will ultimately restrict the glycolytic pathways. So that includes, uh, there will be a decrease in the glucose transporters and a decrease in the production of pyruvate dehydrogenase complex and the activity, the catalytic activity mm. of that enzyme. So the implications are that if you're a very, very low carb, and then you consume high carbohydrates, your glucose levels will go up higher and your body will not use it as, as efficiently. Yeah. So it may be, the implications are for athletes that it may be good to keep in carbohydrates at least to a certain level so you have that metabolic flexibility because if you completely eliminate carbohydrates and then try to introduce them during an event, you are in some way decreasing your metabolic flexibility. Yeah. So it may be good to stay low carb and keep your body for hungry for carbohydrates instead of being so carbohydrate restricted that you're being, so it's not like one or the other. Yeah. And then, uh, but your body always has the ability to use ketones. We have the physiology, we have the ketolytic enzymes, we have the monocarboxylic acid transporters so that we have the ability to transport and utilize ketones. One is not more favorable over the other unless you have a defect in glucose metabolism. So that happens, for example, uh, many neurodegenerative diseases are pathophysiologically linked to impaired glucose metabolism. For example, Alzheimer's disease, a hallmark characteristic is glucose hypometabolism yeah. in the brain. So in that case, or in the case of traumatic brain injury, the ketones or the brain would favorably use ketones over glucose just because the pathway to go from the bloodstream to the mitochondria to make energy is not rate limiting as it would be for glucose. Yeah. Well, that's good yeah. to know. That's mm -hmm. the, yeah. 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 <laughs> Especially for the, for the cyclist because I got so many questions. Yeah. Yeah. It's very yeah. Mm -hmm. unclear for most people. Yeah. Okay, I have, uh, one more question I've been thinking about myself for quite a long time and never found the answer to because um, um, measuring ketones, you can do it in urine, you can do it in blood, you can do it in, uh, in the breath. Mm -hmm. um, I'm totally okay with the urine and the blood measuring, but the, the, the breath measuring, uh, the, that's where yeah. you measure acetone. Yes. And mm -hmm. I always thought um, that the fruity smell that people uh, have when, uh, uh, on their breath when they, they first go into ketosis, that has to mm -hmm. do with acetone, acetone. Yes. Uh, and that disappears within weeks usually. So mm -hmm. I've always thought, okay, acetone apparently goes, yeah, it mm -hmm. disappears. Mm -hmm. But I understand that in the breath measuring that you actually still measure keto, um, the acetones. Is that correct? Okay. So no. I was wondering, yeah. how can this be? Do you still measure uh, uh, acetone ketones in, in, the, in the breath even mm -hmm. after a long period of time? Yeah. Uh, so when you initially, I think what you're getting, when you initially start a ketogenic diet, the ketones can build up in your system and many people experience a decrease in blood, urine, and breath ketones with time because your body is adapting to use ketones a little bit more efficiently uh, over time. And also we have, uh, yeah, the ability to, uh, to, yeah, essentially use them for fuel over time. So in the beginning, they may build up, but the, and many people do experience 
a rise in blood, a rise in ketones on the urine strips, uh, but breath ketones are, uh, so we're still trying to figure out really breath ketones, some companies will tell you that they're highly correlated <laughs> with yeah. blood ketones, uh, and that's true if you're in an isocaloric state, which means your calories match the calories that you're burning. But if you are in a calorie deprived state or a fasting state, what we observe is that there's an a rise in acetone that we don't fully understand and a decrease in beta hydroxybutyrate because our bodies uh, is hungry for energy. So we're sucking more beta hydroxybutyrate out of the blood and using it for energy. Mm -hmm. So when you're fasting, sometimes that'll happen, but the breath acetone will be proportionally higher to blood beta hydroxybutyrates in the context of calorie restriction or in a fasting state. But in a eucaloric diet, they seem to be matched. Uh, this is like personal observations that I've made. Other people I communicate and talk about this with, like Dr. Peter Tia did the mm -hmm. same thing, and a number of people that communicate with me. So there's an interesting biochemistry behind ketone production as it relates to beta hydroxybutyrate acetoacetate and acetone that we don't fully understand. Okay. But I do think under normal conditions that breath, if your breath ketones are elevated, you're in a state of ketosis. Okay. If your urine ketones are elevated on the strip, you're in a state of ketosis. Uh, but blood may be the best biomarker to use. Although if for fat loss, I think breath acetone has been correlated better in the literature with fat loss, there's some indication, and also breath acetone is highly correlated with uh, seizure control. Okay. So I do think that breath ketone measurements are a legitimate tool for that. Okay. And, I, and I'm very interested in to kind of stay um, you know, up to speed on that, but I, I still gravitate towards blood because I like the GKI, yeah. the glucose ketone index that the Keto Mojo yeah. uh, product gives. Yeah. Uh, to yes. that, I would like to add that when you measure your blood ketone, the current technology can only measure one an enantiomer, the D BHB, yeah. mm -hmm. but yeah. it doesn't measure the L uh, yeah. BHB. So in products, for example, mine. Uh, I use both L and D enantiomers because both have different roles and both have different benefits. But when you measure from your blood the BHB content, it's only going to register the D. So basically the other half of the yeah. BHB is in your system and doing its job, but you can't detect yeah. it uh, with, the, with the current technology, with the current uh, blood ketone meters. And then it looks like you have a lower um, uh, ketone level in your blood. Yeah, yeah you would see yeah. lower, yeah. but yeah. 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 yeah, basically you can yeah. it because L yeah. and anti-omers can more uh, go to the brain, for example, which has uh, mm -hmm. additional benefits. Uh, they more likely go to the muscle again uh, than than the D and anti-omer. Uh, they stay around in the blood longer yeah, than the It's like D. a time release, BHB. So basically, for example, if you want to manage uh, inflammation, any kind of chronic inflammation or neuroinflammation, that, that, again, a more important molecule. Yeah. Uh, so just, just mm -hmm. so uh, people know that uh, when they see the, the blood ketone measurements, then there's something else hiding yeah. in your body that yeah. it's not uh, measuring yeah. right now. And the body yeah. does make L, but there's a racemase enzyme that will convert uh, D to L, but uh, we make small amounts of L. But with a supplement, we're able to get a little bit higher levels that stay around longer. And then the L eventually kind of inter will transition back to D, like about 20 to 40%. It's kind of under yeah. debate, but there's an interconversion from L to D. But the important thing is that instead of spiking up and going out, there's more of an extended elevation in the blood and in the tissues, and it's hitting the ketone receptor. There's probably epigenetic effects, and there's anti-inflammatory effects of the molecule that are replicated with D and L. Yeah. So that's very important, I think, for the things that we study, the yeah. pathology, but maybe also for sports, too. Yeah. Well, good to know, because I know, yeah. I know there were people um, uh, comparing products, and there's mm -hmm. the, the one with the 100% uh, DBHB, yeah. mm -hmm. and they say, well, uh, I have higher ketones than that one, but they only measure yeah. half on the racemic mix. Then. Yeah. 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 But, for yeah. example, I talk to people who would take a supplement only with D, uh, trying to treat migraine, and it doesn't do anything, no. and yeah. probably that's the reason they try uh, the KetoStar uh, supplement. 
and they they said yeah. in 20 minutes mm. they're, 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 they're the first uh, migrant yeah. they had just disappeared like multiple times so uh, repeatedly yeah so Most maybe that yeah. that can be a reason we're not sure yet but because this one has l which uh, more likely goes to the brain and the muscle while uh, the d would uh, mostly uh, go to the liver yeah to the energy uh, yeah mm-hmm. our publications which are dozen of publications actually use this racemic mixture yeah so we have actually the very first ketone that we tested was the d enantiomer of a ketone ester and it did not have anti-seizure effects so yeah. that got me looking at different molecules and then the next molecule uh, we studied a couple but the next molecule was uh, essentially the DL beta hydroxybutyrate from 1,3-butanediol, which was racemic mixed with acetoacetate diester. It was a, a patent that Case Western in the United States had, and there was an investigator there, uh, a big, very big guy in the field, and he gave us the recipe to make this particular ketone ester. But it produced the DL, mm-hmm. but it also elevated acetoacetate, and that was very effective for seizures. So we tend to work with that molecule. It's unpalatable and hard to tolerate, so we gravitated, after a couple years, gravitated to investigating ketone salts yeah. and started seeing that these molecules are maybe a more natural way, uh, palatable way, tolerable way to deliver ketosis. So yes. we've been mostly, mostly focusing on balanced electrolyte BHB salt preparations. Yeah, and also more accessible mm-hmm. for, the, for the public. Absolutely, yeah. 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 Cost-wise, taste-wise, yeah. palatability, and also efficacy. I think over time we're developing these to be as potent as ketone esters. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. it's very interesting. I'll just yeah. definitely keep following it. Yeah. Uh, so thank you so much for your time and for doing this interview. Um, where can people find you both uh, on the internet or on social media? Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. both. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Through, uh, through uh, my company, Audacious Nutrition, uh, there's a contact form. If you have any questions, just feel free yeah. to uh, email. Um, Keto yeah. Nutrition Keto uh, is Nutrition. our website. Uh, mm-hmm. Sign up yeah. for the newsletter. All our social medias are on there, I think. And uh, we also have a blog where we write about all these different topics that we're talking about. Yeah, yep. great. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay, well, thank you so much. I hope you enjoy your, your the, the rest of your days here in the, at the Keto Live event in Switzerland. Mm-hmm. And, uh, well, I hope to talk to you again one day. Thank you so much. Thank you thank very you. much. <laughs> thank so, you. Great opportunity. Appreciate it. Mm-hmm.